So this morning we're going to depart uh, from our series a bit. We had been going through Acts, but I thought for Thanksgiving we should should uh, do something special. So we're actually going to be in the book of Numbers uh, in the Old Testament, which is the, the fourth book in, in the Bible. Uh, Numbers chapter 13, if you're following along there. And uh, it's kind of a... It's kind of a camping story. Uh, The Israelites at this point are camping out in the desert, just about to enter the promised land. And so I thought I'd share a few camp and camping stories myself. Uh, One of the things I guess I'm thankful for as I, you know, look back on my life is uh, my parents instilling just a love of the outdoors for me, especially as I was a kid, when I was a kid doing a lot of camping with them and uh and even program stuff you know one of the few clubs I was part of was uh, boy scouts growing up and so that was that was a big part of things as well now we weren't like the boy scouts boy scouts like we were kind of like the lazy man's boy scouts like do the bare minimum of whatever you needed to do to you know qualify for your year's scouting or get your badge or whatever I don't know why that turned out that way, but uh, it suited me just fine. Uh, but one of the things you have to do sort of in your tenure as a Boy Scout is you do have to go on a hike in uh, camping trip. So rather than driving someplace or boating or whatever, you have to hike in with everything you need for the weekend on your back and you have to hike out with it too. Like you are got to be a good Boy Scout. You can't leave a bunch of trash there, right? So we're like... I don't know, 12, 13, 14, and we're, we're hiking in. And I, th- I think I had a bit of an advantage because uh, we were going out to Christina Lake, which is about a half hour from um, where we lived. And, and we had camped out. I th- actually, we'd camped out in the very place we were going before. So I kind of knew the lay of the land that way. I think some of the other guys in the, the scout troop, um, if you just went to the public beach in Christina Lake, like you'd, you'd, you didn't even see half of the lake. Like it was at the opposite end of, of the lake. And so I don't think they knew exactly what they were getting into. And so there was a lot of bragging going on, uh, especially by some of the bigger kids, you know, about how they were going to cruise through this trail. It was going to be no problem. I was a little more tentative about it because I knew it was actually a fairly long trail that we were hiking in on. It turned out to be, I think, about five or six hours actually, um, which wouldn't be a big deal hiking in, except you got like a 40, I think it must've been about a 40 or 50 pound pack on as well. Um, and so a bit of a challenge that way, but so I'd kind of like kept, kept the bragging, you know, to a minimum (laughs) because that was, that was kind of always in any sort of physical or athletic pursuit. That was sort of my survival mechanism through my teens was just middle of the pack, you know, don't be the slowest, but don't try to be the fastest either. So the guys that got out there, um, you know, at the head of the pack, yeah, they they blazed away for a good hour or two. But then your stamina, kind of like if you're going as fast as you possibly can, that that you power out pretty quick. And sure enough, you know, the the tortoise kind of ends up passing them, and they kind of crawled in like to camp. And, you know, by the end, you know, at least a good hour after the the rest of us. Uh, and so they just hadn't quite anticipated just how long that trip was going to be. And, and as we get into scripture here this morning, the, the, the episode we get into scriptures is one that's for people that are at all familiar with scriptures is quite familiar, actually. It's, it's the people of Israel uh, getting guided through the desert and they're just about to enter the promised land and they sp- send some people in to spy it out. And the report comes back and they are astonished at what they're hearing and, and dismayed. They've been wandering through the desert for several months here. And you can tell they're expecting to just kind of trounce into the promised land. Like we're just going to steamroll in there and, and it's just going to be delivered into our hands. You know, no work whatsoever. But the report they get back is actually much different. And so that's where we're going to pick up the, uh, the story this morning. And so we're actually going to skip in chapter 13, right to verse 31. Uh, The initial uh, report is already given. And uh, 10 of the spies, there's a song about this, but we won't sing it because we can't sing. But 10 of the spies say, no, no, we can't go in there and invade. There's all these giants that live there, and it's just a horrible place. We can't, we can't go there. And two of the spies, by name Caleb and Joshua, um, say, yeah, all that's true. There are giants that live there, but it's a good land. God has promised it to us. 
And so after the, the sort of this first initial exchange, we pick it up in verse 31. It says, but the men who had gone up with him, that is Caleb, said, we can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak come from the come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So it, it, it doesn't look hopeful. They, they've gone and explored, and they've been told about this land that they're returning to. It's been 400 years since the Israelites have lived there, and, and it's been described as a land flowing with milk and honey, which is an interesting description uh, in a, of itself in terms of agriculture, but we, I'll, I'll try not to get sidetracked here. The, the spies go in and they find out, yeah, it is lush. There's, it's a rich land, but it's also like got a lot of fortified cities. And there's a lot of huge people living there. Giants, they call them. And so they're dismayed by this. So in chapter 14, it carries on. It says, that night, all the members of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, Oh, if only we died in Egypt or in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, We should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Now remember, this is the same Egypt where they were slaves. <laughs> where they were were being literally worked to death. And so this is quite a statement. Verse 5 then says, Then Moses and Aaron fell face down in front of the whole Israelite assembly and gathered there. And this is kind of the, the statement that I want us to kind of key in on here. Joshua, verse 6, Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. If there's one thing you need to know about Joshua is that he is a courageous leader. And in this scene, I think it's kind of telling because the other Israelites, even the other spies, to me kind of come off as ungrateful. Like they've been delivered by miraculously, you know, the the, 10 pl- the 12 plagues in, in Egypt, uh, the parting of the Red Sea, they've been delivered from slavery miraculously. And it's sort of at some of the first real hint that they might have to work uh, for this new promised land. They say, oh, we should just go back to slavery. And, and they're not thankful for what God has done for them. And what strikes me about Joshua is that I think he is thankful. You have to read between the lines a little bit. I think, but he's grateful for what God has done. And it shows that his thankfulness requires courage. And that's sort of what separates him and Caleb from everybody else is that they're courageous and courageous enough to be thankful. And so that's maybe what I want us to take away this morning. Well, that is what I want us to take away is that thankfulness requires courage but it doesn't require some other things. And, and we should note that about Joshua, uh, that it didn't require him to kind of try and look for silver linings. Because I think that's often our first uh, play that we go to in our playbook when we get to Thanksgiving is like, even if things are terrible, well, I'll try and find the silver lining in this. Um, you know, Joshua is not saying, well, yeah, there's giants there, but the, the wine is going to be great. Like these, they've got some really nice grapes there. You know, he could have gone that direction, but he says, no, the giants are real, and, and, and it's a mixed bag for sure. Uh, and he's not trying to focus on just the good things to the exclusion of the bad. And he's not also bending the truth. He's not saying, well, yeah, they're, ju- they're tall, but they're not that tall. And, you know, he, he's not trying to downplay the danger that is there. Um, 
you know, I think some of our world leaders, we've seen that happen during the pandemic. You know, it's, it's, it's not, rather than facing reality, it's, it's trying to sort of couch it in a way that it sounds less abrasive. Uh, and I've appreciated, well, even in our own province, uh, Dr. Dina Hinshaw being very forthright and in, in not seeking to bend the truth and, and just saying, yeah, that, you know, when there's an outbreak going on, it's like, yeah, that's troubling. And we need to think about how that happened and how we can prevent further ones. You know, just very plain with the truth. And, and Joshua is the same way. Yes, there are giants. Yes, there are fortified cities that will have to be conquered. And, but he says in the midst of that, their protection is gone. The Lord is with us now. And if the Lord is with us, then we can, we can conquer that land. And I think that's probably a bit of the secret uh, sauce there for Joshua. But we'll we'll do more on that later. I I bring this episode up, I think, this morning because I don't know about you, but especially coming into the fall here, and we're kind of hitting what seems like a bit of a second wave in the pandemic. It's easy to get winded by it. I I don't know about you, but it's like I I've talked to a lot of people recently that it was like, okay, when this first broke out, it's like, okay, we have to be really careful. And numbers were rising quickly, so we we kind of. Uh, attacked it as best we could in terms of strict uh, hygiene and and limiting social engagement. But then here in the fall, it's kind of like, I think a lot of people didn't anticipate that. And we kind of find ourselves winded uh, in in our response. Like, I'm I'm kind of tired of of this. I, I hadn't anticipated it being quite such a long haul. Uh and and it's and it's still going and, and so we kind of i think find ourselves in this place of like okay oh this is worse than the, than i thought it was going to be it's taking longer than I, than i thought it would how do i how do i carry on with life in the midst of that where do i find joy in the midst of that um i was chatting with our superintendent a couple of weeks ago and i thought he he put it really succinctly he says i'm looking back over the last year and it's been pretty crappy <laughs> It's like, good Don, thank you for, for putting that so straightforward for me. But it's true. You know, how do we praise God? How do we be thankful in the midst of a crappy year? And and I think Joshua kind of holds a bit of the secret for us. And, and even for him, he was able to say, yeah, my circumstances are far less than perfect, but God is with me. And as Christians, as followers of Christ, we have just probably even more reason, I think, to be thankful in Jesus Christ. That's actually right in the New Testament. Uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 5, verse 18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances. It's one of those cute little commands that comes up, and you can kind of read past, but if you take it seriously, you realize how impossible it actually is. But thankfully, the verse doesn't end there. It says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you, in Christ Jesus. And so the reminder for us there is it's not that we're giving thanks for all circumstances. You know, thank you, Lord, that I can't go to a movie theater because they're all closed down. And I haven't been to a restaurant in, in nine months. That's, that's not the point. It's that we are to be thankful in Jesus Christ. And so Joshua actually even hints at that for us uh, in his own life. We see, I think... This is kind of his first time on the stage here in Numbers, where we kind of get to see him in action and what kind of person he's been. But there's the reality of God in his life is just, it, it comes out in every encounter he has. And the first time we hear about him, he's kind of serving as, I guess you could call altar boy to Moses. Uh, when when Moses enters the tabernacle and sees God face to face, Joshua is there helping out. And, and I get this impression that that, sense of the reality of God's presence in his life is something that's left a deep impression because you see this all throughout his life is that God is imminent. God is right there with Joshua. Um, Later, though, in Joshua chapter 1, uh, they're poised to actually enter the promised land now. This this spying out, if you're not aware, is, a, is an abortive attempt. They end up spending the next 40 years wandering the desert because the people don't want to go up and conquer the promised land. So when they are finally ready for it, uh, in Joshua chapter 1, God commands him and says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. 
And this carries on through Joshua's life. Uh, we get to the end of Joshua in chapters 23 and 24. And, and he doesn't come out and like try to make a theological argument for the presence of God in the midst of Israel. He just sort of assumes it. And if you read those chapters later, which I'd encourage you to look at, it's just there's this sense of Joshua's immediacy to God. That he's just... He's just it's as though he's just ha- standing right behind his shoulder. He can sense that God is right there. And in fact, one of Joshua's few sort of faux pas, errors, failures uh, recorded in the book of Joshua is, is forgetting that for a moment. Uh, the Gibeonites come and deceive the Israelites, it trick them into signing a pre- peace treaty with them. And the, sort of the, the fallout from it, you realize, is that Joshua just failed to ask God about it. He went about it as though God wasn't there, as though he couldn't just turn quickly and ask God, what do you think about this? What do you think I should do in this situation? But the good news is Joshua kind of learns from that uh, mistake and and listens to God. And, and that f- from that point on where the, the text is very conspicuous to say Joshua would always, you know, whether it was a big battle coming up or just an important decision that needed to be made, he sought God's wisdom in that. He always knew that God was near. But what strikes me about Joshua is even in that those last couple chapters, you have this sense of, you know, it's it's him sort of giving his farewell address. He knows he's about to die. And so he's giving the next generation sort of their marching orders, what they need to do. And you can read the book of Joshua uh, as sort of them coming into the promised land. There's a bunch of battles. They conquer the land. And then Joshua... Um, gives up the ghost and everything's good. But it, that skips over a lot of the important detail. And the important detail is, yes, there are a lot of b- battles, but even by the end of Joshua's lifetime, a lot of major um, tribes, Gentile tribes, are still present in the promised land. Like everything is not perfect by the, the time Joshua passes away. And if you read those last couple chapters, he's very explicit about that. He says, there are still a lot of people in this land that you need to drive out. And the big battles we read about, that's sort of like getting rid of the major armies and governments that were in place in the promised land. But there's still a lot of like scattered tribes and people that possess their own land throughout Israel. And they, they need to go as well. Joshua warns them. He says, if you leave them in the promised land, you're going to intermarry with them. And your sons and daughters will be drawn away to worshiping false gods. And so you need to drive them out. And so in the midst of this, Joshua is acknowledging God's goodness. But he's also acknowledging that, that things aren't perfect. He's thankful to God, to how God has been with the people all through the t- their time of conquering the promised land. And yet he's v- being very honest about saying there are still some big challenges uh, present in the land. In fact, those, those descendants of Anak we read about in Numbers, they're still there. In fact, the, those are the people actually that David fights, and it's David that ends up driving them out of the land hundreds of years later. Goliath, that David famously battles, is one of these giants uh, that never quite get out of the land until his time. And so it would be easy, I think, for Joshua to end his life discouraged and saying, what was the point of all this? Like, we fought and we fought and wandered in the desert, and here we are in the middle of this promised land, and yet there's still all of these challenges ahead of us. But he's not discouraged. He's, he's encouraged. He's, he's thankful to God, and I think it, it's because of his courage. And, and he, he doesn't he comes off as an incredibly courageous person, but I think as you listen to his words, it's not so much that you know he's saying, oh, I can go out and do this by my own power. It's always because the Lord is with us. Joshua 1.9, you know, be strong and courageous for the Lord your God is with you. And I think that's the message for me this morning. I, I hope that's the message for you is that we can be thankful because we know that God is with us. Whatever our circumstances find us in, whatever level of isolation we have to be living through, we can be thankful and courageous because God is with us. And, and I think as Christians, as you know, people that exist thousands of years after Joshua, we know even more of the story. You know, that, that verse, Joshua 1, 9, be strong and courageous uh, because the Lord your God is with you. There's a phrase in there that says, I will, he will never leave you nor forsake you. 
And that's repeated for us in the New Testament by the author of Hebrews to say that Jesus Christ himself never leaves us. And that when we become followers of Jesus, when we uh, accept his salvation, that we are never separated from him through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so that kind of gives us a moment to pause this morning uh, and, and thank God for that. To, to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, that, that he hung on a cross for us and, and cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So that we would never have to utter those words. That, that he was bereft and alone so that we could be close to God and know that God is always with us. And so it seems appropriate that we, we relish in his presence this morning and, and celebrate that fact. So we're going to take some time and actually celebrate communion, something we haven't done. Um, for many months together. Pray with me a moment. Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that uh, even when we would like to wander away and do our own thing, he welcomes us back with open arms, Lord, and that the grace that we have in Jesus Christ is not just the forgetting of our sins, it's the casting away of them, the abolishing, as though they were no more, and that in you we have an abundant life available to us, uh, a way forward of walking with you and in, in courage and thankfulness and joy, not because all of life's difficulties are erased, but because you promise never to leave us. And so we thank you for that promise. We thank you for enduring separation from your father so that we would never have to. Thank you for the, the life, the relationship that we can have with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I promised... Uh, We'd be talking a bit about camping this morning, so I thought I'd, I'd wrap up with a, a tale of a, of a camp, a different sort of camp. But let me first read you a little quote here that I think sums things up well. Uh, it's from a, a, a Dutch monk, actually, from about 600 years ago. Thomas Akempis says, As I please him in prosperity, as I please God in prosperity, so in adversity I am not displeasing to him. I think that's a powerful statement to say, you know, yeah, we're in the middle of a pandemic. It's it's not God saying I'm upset with you and we can we can enjoy God's presence nonetheless. Campus goes on to say, the wise lover of God regards not so much the gift of him who loves as the love of him who gives. And I think that's the point, is that as we look around at the good things that God has given us, you know, maybe we are looking for silver linings a little bit. The point is not so much to get fixated on the gift, it's to get fixated on the giver, to notice the presence of Jesus Christ in our midst. But but here's here's a final camp story for you uh, that is a little bit of a silver lining story. It's told by uh, Corey Ten Boom, uh, who... If you're not familiar, she uh, was part of the Dutch resistance, her and her family, during World War II. They hid Jews in their house, and they were eventually found out. And so she and her sister, who I think were both in about their 40s at the time, and her father, who was, I think, well into his 70s, perhaps his early 80s, they were all sent off to concentration camps. And they were, the whole family, they were believers, uh, the Christians, and so uh, her sister, Corey's sister, Bessie, she says, describes as uh, being the one that kept their spirits up, uh, kept them sort of on the right path, as it were. And uh, I think that'll be an interesting conversation in heaven because we only ever hear Corey's side. Uh, her sister, Bessie, passes away in the concentration camp in a different concentra concentration camp. Her father passes away as well. But when they first enter, they realize that this is not something that they had heard about in the news at some point. Uh, of course, the concentration camps were a bit of a secret uh, for, with the Nazi regime. And so they got into just horrible conditions. They were locked in this large room, probably a bit bigger uh, than the room we're gathering in today, but hundreds of women in there with them. And immediately you could tell there's like disease and 
you know, it stank. There wasn't air circulation. It, w- it was just a holding pen, really. And probably the thing that got uh, Corey the most uh, under her skin was, the, well, yeah, there was rats, but there was also um, lice. And the worst was the fleas, she said, like the just the biting everywhere. And she said the, the lice you could kind of like pick out of your hair and stuff, but the fleas, they were just everywhere. And uh, she was just... It it just hit her like a ton of bricks. And Bessie just looks at her the first day they're in there and quotes 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Give thanks in all circumstances. <laughs> and and Corey is just like a gas. Like, how can you even say that to me? Like, this is not this is not anything to be thankful about or any place to be thankful. But time carries on. They're there for quite a while. And so Corey and uh, her sister, in order just to... Uh, carry on life as normally as they can, continue their, their habit of prayer and even uh, singing praise to God on occasion. They'll, they'll sing together. And some of it is just to keep their spirits up. But as you can imagine, locked in a room with hundreds of other people with barely just enough space to sleep on your cot, um, there, there isn't too much privacy. And so people start joining them for prayer and and they start holding almost like church services in this place, which is really strange because everything they know about the Nazis is that they, they are against any form of Christianity and, and they've already in Holland, they've clamped down on the churches when they're meeting and when the, you know, meeting in your homes for prayer meetings was no longer allowed. And there's a lot of restrictions there, but they had great freedom for some reason in this prison and they couldn't figure it out. And then finally, after a few weeks of being there, somebody uh, clues them in and says, well, why, why, do we, why can we do this this way? And uh, they say, well, have you ever seen a prison guard actually in the room with us here? And it's like, no, I guess they just come in and, you know, as far as the door and, and hand the food in and then they leave. And they said, well, they don't want to come in here because of all the fleas and lice and, and rats. They like it's putrid to them. They, it's gross. They just physically don't want to come into the room. And so they, they kind of leave us to our own devices. And so Bessie looks at her and says, you see, Corey, we wouldn't have this freedom to, to share the gospel, to pray for people if it wasn't for the fleas. And so we can be thankful for even them. <laughs> Again, a bit of a, a silver lining, but it, but it strikes home to me in that it's like, yeah, there's, you know, things could be worse. Things could be worse. And even in the midst of the pandemic and restrictions and, and everything else, I think if we kn- know the reality of God's presence in our lives, then we can be thankful. And and we will find we will find reasons to be thankful, things to be thankful for. But we also should, uh, of course, bear in mind who we're being thankful to. Let's take a moment and and pray to finish our service. Lord, thank you for being with us here this morning. Thank you for your word that draws us back to you continually. And so we thank you for the opportunity to draw near to you this morning. And we pray that uh, whatever the weekend or the week ahead holds for us, Lord, that we would would just have a very real and clear sense of you being with us in whatever comes our way. And so we thank you for the opportunity to gather here this morning, and we pray that you would uh, go with us as we head out the door. In Jesus' name, amen.